Hi, my name is Crystal Dahl. I am located in Minneapolis, Minnesota and work at Meritas' headquarters. I would like to welcome and thank each of you for joining us on today's webinar, Securities Law, Advising Clients About General Solicitations in Rule 506 Private Placements After the Jobs Act. Today's webinar will be presented by John Eckstein, a director at Meritas' Denver, Colorado affiliate, Fairfield & Woods. John has focused his practice on corporate and securities law for more than 35 years. His clients include public and private operating companies, private funds, family offices, broker dealers, investment advisors, and institutions active in several states and countries. He has spoken on securities law and CLE programs and served as an expert witness on securities matters. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to walk through a few housekeeping items. As you may have already noticed, your phone lines have been muted. We do, however, still encourage you to ask questions. You may do so by using the chat feature shown on the left-hand side of your screen. Simply type in your question, hit send, and John will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Should you have any technical difficulties, please press star zero, and an operator will join the line to assist you. With that, John, are you ready to begin? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Go ahead, John. Sure, I'm trying to move this. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Uh, Gil Selinger and I, Gil was supposed to be here, but he went home sick about it an hour ago, so I'm going to cover his slides too. Gil and I want to thank you, Kim, and everyone on the staff of Meritas for your kind assistance in putting this opportunity before us and assisting us with this presentation today. We're lawyers at Fairfield & Woods PC in Denver, Colorado. Fairfield & Woods was founded in 1934 and is now comprised of about 45 lawyers and 10 paralegals. We're principally organized in three departments, corporate, real estate, and litigation. We're very new to Meritas, but we're excited to be hosting the Meritas Annual International Meeting in April of 2015 here in Denver. So we urge everyone to come visit Denver, the Mile High City, and the state of Colorado. The securities law practice of Fairfield New Woods is comprised of all or part of the law practices of 10 lawyers, some of in each of the three departments. The practice is described on several pages of our website, which is at www.fwlaw.com. I'm in the corporate department, and together with four other lawyers here in this department, focus predominantly upon public and private companies and public and private offerings of securities and related reporting. We are also involved in advising regulated and quasi-regulated clients, such as broker-dealers, investment advisors, and private fund advisors and family offices. At least one lawyer in our corporate department focuses on the securities activities of banks. Lawyers in our real estate department address securities issues in real estate syndications and municipal securities. Our litigation securities lawyers focus on disputes and dispute resolution involving these regulated entities, plus white collar issues such as insider trading and Department of Justice and SEC and FINRA investigations. More on FINRA later. There are some persons attending this webinar who do not practice law in the United States. Thus, I'm going to give you at the outset a very, very basic outline of how securities law works in the United States as it applies to offerings of securities in this country. I will go through then the uh, changes and additions to Rule 506 under the JOBS Act. I'll talk next about the new bad actor provisions, which are also changes to Rule 506, which are driven by the Dodd-Frank financial reform legislation. And then I'll talk a little bit about some proposed additional changes in Form D related to Rule 506. We'll then go through a few of the open issues which lawyers are discussing and strategies which lawyers are considering when utilizing the new 506C exemption. As noted by Crystal, I will try to leave some time for your questions at the end. By the way, uh, all the Rule 506 changes are available at the SEC's website, that is www.sec.gov you'll find the final rules, and there are two sets, the 
Rule 506 changes and the bad actor changes under the final rules of, of July 10, 2013. And you'll find the proposed rules for Form D, which I'll talk about, for July in the proposed rules section of sec.gov for July 10, 2013. I do want to call your attention to two articles on our law firm's website which outline in more detail what I'm about to talk about. One is called Information for the Small Business Person Considering Selling Securities After Enactment of the Jobs Act in 2012. This is a very basic article about the Securities Act of 1933 as applied to persons who have not been involved in selling securities. It's the most often accessed article on our law firm's website. We also have an article there called Private Placements, Exemption and Disclosure Issues After the Jobs Act. This second article is a more complicated presentation focusing on concerns general practice lawyers might have when addressing some basic questions which can arise in structuring a private offering of securities. I'll give you the contact information about these two articles again at the end of this presentation. One footnote to this presentation, in this short talk, I'm not going to be talking about changes to the secondary offering of securities under Rule 144A, although that is also affected in the JOBS Act and in the releases that, uh, uh, in the first release that I'll talk about. And we're also not going to focus on the effects of these changes upon private funds per se, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. If you have an institutional client for whom 144A is an issue, or if you represent hedge funds or private equity or venture capital funds, just contact me directly and we'll try to give you some specifics. I'm going to turn now to a, a quick and dirty summary of securities laws in the United States. The federal government and the several states regulate the offering and sale of securities in this country. There's a comprehensive scheme for this. Everything has to be registered with a regulator unless it's exempt from registration. Foreign countries also have such laws. Ours are uh, federal and state. Okay? A person selling securities must comply with the securities laws and regulations of each separate securities authority. Compliance with the laws and rules of one securities authority does not constitute compliance with the laws and regulations of any other U.S. securities authorities. So if securities are sold in every state, one must comply with the laws and regulations of approximately 52 separate securities authorities. Plus FINRA, uh, FINRA is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority which took over from the NASD. If you're going to use an intermediary, like a broker-dealer. Okay. So at the minimum, you have to comply with at least two separate laws, the federal laws and the laws of the state where the securities are being sold. Okay. Unless there is something called preemption, which we'll get into a little bit where the, later, where the federal government has said that they're going to preempt the states from regulation. But this creates constitutional issues, so there are very few areas where there is federal preemption of state securities laws. Okay. I will try to point out this, this conversation and this presentation is mostly about the federal securities laws, but some of the issues we're going to discuss haven't yet been sorted out at the state level. Okay. With that, I want to turn to the slides and start to chat a little bit about what's new and what's not new under the JOBS Act, Title II, Rule 506. So you can see from this slide that this is important. At least some law firms think so. Skadden Arps, Dorsey and Whitney, Freed Frank, Harris Shriver and Jacobson, one of our local firms, Brownstein. So we thought we'd have a quote too. So we think it's a true game changer in raising private capital. How important is this? In 2012, $900 billion of capital was raised in the United States under Rule 506 compared to $1.2 trillion through public offerings in our country. Of the $900 billion raised under Rule 506, 
720 billion was raised by private funds and 180 billion was raised by operating companies. So you can see that four-fifths of the money raised under Rule 506 is raised by private funds and operating companies have tended to be the tail and the dog in the debate about uh, enacting these rules and the SEC has tended to focus more on their effect on hedge funds okay. and private equity. So what I'm going to talk about again today is the existing Rule 506, which is now going to be called Rule 506B, the new Rule 506C, the new bad actor rules for both the old and the new 506, and some proposed rules for the Form D, which is a filing that is done uh, with the SEC if one is utilizing Rule 506. It's important to note that private placements originate in the 1933 Act as a self-executing exemption under Section 4A2. It used to be called Section 4.2, but after the Dodd-Frank Act, it got renumbered to 4A2. A safe harbor promulgated by the SEC with its own rule where the power to the SEC comes out of Section 4A2 is Rule 506 under Regulation D. That rule, which is still operative and will still be operative after the effective date of the new exemption for 506C, requires, among other things, that private placements made in accordance with the rule not utilize any form of general solicitation or general advertising to offer or sell the securities of the issuer. Under that rule as well, the issuer may sell its securities to an unlimited number of accredited investors and to no more than 35 other purchasers, and all the investors need to be sophisticated. It should be noted for purposes of comparison to what has just happened that the old Rule 506 safe harbor allowed offerings to be made with the involvement of people we're going to call bad actors. But this has changed because of the Jobs Act. The new Rule 506C was dictated by the Congress in Title II of the Jobs Act, actually it's Section 201A, and it was supposed to result in regulations. The Jobs Act was signed into law April 5, 2010, excuse me, 2012, and it was supposed to generate a new regulation from the SEC by July 4, 2012. Unfortunately, it became a great subject of debate, and it took until July 10th of 2013 for the SEC to adopt final rules. On that date, they adopted their new Rule 506C, which covers private placements to accredited investors only. This new rule eliminates the prohibition against general advertising and general solicitation and it's effective September 23rd, 2013. This new rule, 506C, creates a new exemption that is solely the result of the power that the Congress has given to the SEC to promulgate it. Therefore, rule 506C does not derive from the SEC's power under 4A2, the statute, and it is, a, it is a, an exemption unto itself. That is, if you fail to satisfy Rule 506C, there is no statute to fall back on. Uh, you've just failed to comply. Okay? That Rule 506C 
has the following criteria. They're very simple. You can use general advertising and general solicitation if all the purchasers are accredited or the um, an issuer reasonably believes that they are accredited at the time of sale. Plus, the issuer must take reasonable steps to verify that the purchasers are accredited investors. And the issuer still needs to comply with the definitional rules, the integration rules, and the restrictive resale provisions uh, that are in the existing rule regulation, rule 506, which is part of regulation D. So the focus of the attention given to this rule in this context is on how do we verify accreditation. Okay. Generally, the SEC says, issuers should take an objective, principles-based approach, considering the facts and circumstances of each purchaser and each transaction. That means that each issuer needs to consider the type of purchaser and the type of accredited investor that the purchaser claims to be. Must consider the amount and type of information that the issuer has about the purchaser and consider the nature of the offering, including the manner in which the purchaser was solicited to participate in the offering or the terms of the offering, such as a minimum investment amount. Now, one question uh, that probably is coming up here to some people is, what is an accredited investor? And there are eight or nine categories of accredited investor in uh, Regulation D, the focus uh, of the debate that occurred between when the proposed rules came out and the final rules was how do we verify the accredited status of the individuals who are involved in the offering? And the um, SEC resisted uh, putting out any uh, safe harbors or presumptions in this regard during the debate, but in the final rule, it provides some methods which it will deem satisfactory, that is reasonable, to verify the individual status as an accredited investor and different processes uh, will be uh, accepted in that regard. With regards to natural persons, and remember that the rule about accredited investors uh, for natural persons says that they should have a uh, net income of 200000 a year in each of the last two years, or a joint income in excess of 300000 with their spouse for those two years, and have an expectation to have that income in the current year. That's under the old rule and the new rule. With regards to individuals and, and net worth, you have to show that they were millionaires, uh, excluding uh, the value of their primary residence. And so the verification of these criteria uh, are permitted by the uh, SEC uh, under at least four different ways of, 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 at least four different ways, but possibly others. With regards to verifying income, it is uh, acceptable if the issuer has reviewed copies of any IRS form that reports the prospective investor's income for the two most recent years, including but not limited to a Form W-2, Form 1099, Schedule K-1 to Form 1065, or the 1040s, plus getting a written representation from the prospective investor that he or she has a reasonable expectation of reaching the required income level in the current year. With regards to uh, verifying the $1 million net worth uh, uh, category, uh, it's acceptable if the issuer reviews copies of one or more of the following types of documentation dated within the prior three months related to the prospective investor's assets and liabilities. For assets, bank statements, brokerage statements, and other statements of securities holdings certificates of deposit, 
tax assessments, appraisal reports are acceptable. For liabilities, consumer or credit reports from at least one of the nationwide consumer reporting agencies are acceptable. Plus, after you've looked at assets and liabilities, you need to get a written representation, if you're the issuer, from the prospective investor that all liabilities necessary to make a determination of net worth have been disclosed. A third way of uh, verifying accreditation is to obtain a written confirmation from a registered broker-dealer, an SEC-registered investment advisor, a licensed attorney who's in good standing, or a certified public accountant who's duly registered in good standing, that that third party has taken reasonable steps to verify that the prospective investor is an accredited investor within the prior three months and actually has determined that the prospective investor is an accredited investor. And there's a fourth category as well, uh, and that's with regards to persons who have purchased securities from the same issuer in a prior 506B offering. And uh, you, what you do there is you simply get a written confirmation that that purchaser is still accredited for purposes of the new offering. So in a nutshell, that is the new 506C and it's effective September 23rd. And when we get into stratagems and tactics, I'll give a few comments about how it is uh, creating uh, different ways of planning and opening questions that remain. Also on the uh, 10th of July, the SEC promulgated a second set of final rules also effective on September 23rd that relate to uh, requirements under the Dodd-Frank Financial Reforms Act that under Section 926 of that act, which came out in, uh, I think, 2010, that the scope of Rule 506 and the ability to use it, utilize it be limited with regards to certain persons who have um, been subject to uh, or have engaged in certain kinds of activities. So uh, this slide shows where the bad actor rules have come into play. And the bottom line is that under the new Rule 506D, the safe harbor of Rule 506, and this is both 506B, the old 506, and the new 506C, will not be available if certain covered persons have uh, been the subject to a disqualifying event. Now, I've summarized in this slide, or Gil has summarized in this slide, some of the covered persons and some of the disqualifying events, but it's much broader than this. And the penalties for, for, being, for, for losing 506 are pretty strong. 506, if you'll recall, preempts the states from regulating offerings. That's why 95% of all Regulation D offerings are done under 506, because they can pre pre preempt the states from regulating the activity. And so I'm going to read out who all the covered persons are, um, and then I will uh, read out the disqualifying events. I'll still summarize, so I encourage anyone who wants to use this to go to 506D and look at the bad actor disqualifications. Covered persons are the following, include the following. The issuer, any predecessor of the issuer, any affiliated issuer, any director, executive officer, or other officer participating in the offering, or a general partner or managing member of the issuer. Any beneficial owner of 20% of more of the issuer's outstanding voting securities. Any promoter connected with the issuer in any capacity at the time of such sale. Any investment manager of an issuer that's a pooled investment fund. 
any person that has been paid or will be paid directly or indirectly remuneration for solicitation of purchasers in connection with the sale of securities. And my aside on that is, that's not just broker-dealers, that's also finders, if you understand that concept. Plus, any general partner or any managing member of any such investment manager or solicitor, or any director, executive officer, or other officer participating in the offering of any such investment manager or solicitor, or general partner or managing member of such investment manager or solicitor. So there's a broad range of persons involved with an issuer or the offering who are, quote, covered persons, close quote. Now, the second part of this is what are the disqualifying events? And this is a very summarized uh, list of disqualifying events on your slide. I'm going to give you some more of the flavor of this. It goes on in the rule I'm looking at for two and a half pages. So uh, I encourage you once again to look at the rule. Okay. But it begins, um, if any of the covered persons have been convicted within 10 years before such sale or five years in the case of issuers, their predecessors, and affiliated issuers of any felony or misdemeanor, in connection with the purchase or sale of any security, involving the making of any false filing with the SEC, or arising out of the conduct of the business of an underwriter, broker, dealer, municipal securities dealer, investment advisor, or paid solicitor, or is subject to any order, judgment, or decree of any court of competent jurisdiction issued within five years before such sale, which restrains or enjoins the person from engaging in a practice, once again, in connection with the purchase or sale of any security, involving the making of any false filings with the SEC, or arising out of the conduct of the business of an underwriter, broker dealer, municipal securities dealer, investment advisor, or paid solicitor, or is the subject of a final order of a state securities commissioner or a state authority that examines banks, savings associations, or credit unions, a state insurance commissioner, an appropriate federal banking agency, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, or the National Credit Union Administration that bars the person from association, once again, because of securities violations, or constitutes a, a final order uh, based on a violation of the law within the last 10 years. The, the list goes on, subject to an order of the SEC, uh, that suspends or revokes their registration or places limits on their activities or bars them from being associated with penny stocks um, or subject to any order of the SEC within the last five years, which is a cease and desist order. Um, and the list just continues on and on. Okay, So please recall this uh, covered disqualifying events with regards to covered persons when you're using Rule 506 after September 23rd. A large part of the debate and the reason it took so long for these rules to be promulgated was that the SEC had originally intended that failures prior to the effective date of persons would disqualify them from use of Rule 506. Now, the rule is pro, uh, looks forward, not backward, with regards to the bars and with regards to the disqualifications. But if you have been the subject of a disqualifying event or if someone in the company has been that occurred prior to September 23rd, 2013, that must be disclosed in your offering materials to uh, investors under both 506B and 506C, even if it doesn't bar you. But going forward to a have any of these disqualifying events occur after September 23rd, that will uh, result in the loss of the disqualification. Now, there are some limitations on uh, the uh, disqualification. Um, if there's a showing of good cause without prejudice the SEC, and without prejudice to any other action by the SEC, the SEC can decide that it's not necessary that exemption be denied or a court can determine that a disqualification should not arise 
Or if the issuer can show that it did not know, and in the exercise of reasonable care, could not have known that a disqualification existed, then it's not a disqualification of the offering uh, or the use of Rule 506. There's also a set of new proposed rules that came out for Form D, uh, also came out on July 10th, 2013. And these proposed rules uh, take away a great deal of the flexibility uh, that Congress and uh, the issuing community of uh, private funds and companies thought would be uh, coming their way because of the general advertising opportunity given under the JOBS Act and the new Rule 506C. Um, in a nutshell, these are proposed rules, the comment period on them in September 23rd, but basically, um, what they call for is if you intend to do, and this is, these are all proposed, no later than 15 days prior to the first use of general solicitation or general advertising, you would have to file an advance form D, which would contain a lot of information, okay, which isn't currently on form uh, D. So uh, some people have been complaining they would have to sort of tip their hand as to what their offering was going to look like. Okay. Uh, also, um, the uh, a closing amendment would need to be filed uh, within 30 days after the termination of the 506C offering on Form D. Uh, recall, if you do, that right now you've got to file a Form D within 15 days after the first uh, sale, and uh, if the offering continues for a year, you have to file another uh, Form D uh, 100 and, uh, 360 days after the uh, first uh, first sale. Uh, so you'd, you'd be doing the advance Form uh, D, you'd be doing the 15-day after uh, Form D, and you'd be doing the closing amendment Form D, and if it went on for a year, you'd be filing another Form D at the end of the first year, okay? Um, the, another set of proposals here governs what the SEC would expect to see in general solicitation materials, and they have proposed a set of mandatory legends and disclosures. Um, it is not a uh, stretch for a securities lawyer to accept, uh, and for persons who are used to doing public offerings or maybe Reg A offerings, these type of disclosures, but uh, it would be a uh, new uh, thing for uh, folks who have been doing private placements to be required to put this language in their um, offering documents since uh, uh, Rule 506 first came out and preempted the states. I'll just read to you the statements that would have to appear uh, in the general solicitation materials. Uh, it's sort of legends at the bottom of, of a page, for example, in, the, in an advertisement in a newspaper. The securities may be sold only to accredited investors which for natural persons are investors who meet certain minimum annual income or net worth thresholds. The securities are being offered in reliance on an exemption from the registration requirements of the U.S. Securities Act of 1933 and are not required to comply with specific disclosure requirements that apply to registration under the Securities Act. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, has not passed upon the merits of nor given its approval to the securities, the terms of the offering, or the accuracy or completeness of any offering materials. The securities are subject to legal restrictions on transfer and resale, and investors should not assume that they will be able to resell their securities. Investing in securities involves risk, and investors should be able to bear the loss of their investment. Fifth 
So uh, the jury is still out on the Form D. There are additional uh, proposals uh, with regards to uh, the proposing release. Um, Form D is going to expand in all its forms for all its filings with regards to additional information. The SEC also uh, would add a disqualification. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the first item on this slide I didn't mention. The SEC proposes that a failure to file Form D at any time in the last five years would disqualify an issuer for the next five years, actually, uh, from relying on any, for, any part of Rule 506, uh, old or new, for another five years unless, uh, this, this little bullet point is, is, is oversummarized here, unless the issuer gets caught up. You file, you would look at what you forgot to file or didn't file. You file all the forms you have for all the prior offerings you did and get yourself caught up. And then you'd only be barred from using 506 for a year. Plus, um, that, that bar for using 506 for the year would not apply to the current 506 offering uh, in which you were engaged when you discovered you hadn't filed the prior uh, Form Ds, okay? So it's a way of uh, forcing folks to file Form uh, uh, Ds. The SEC is convinced that many more um, Regulation D 506 offerings go on than it knows about because uh, up to now the filing of the Form D was not a condition of the exemption. And uh, so it is trying to get better filing and has come up with this penalty. This is a proposed penalty again. Okay. Another proposal, uh, which is not on these sheets, would uh, add a temporary rule 510T requiring issuers that conduct an offering pursuant to 506C to submit their written general solicitation materials directly to the SEC through an intake page on their website, no later than the date of first use. So you would be submitting all your offering documents, all your general solicitation offering documents to the SEC on their website. This would not be filings with the SEC, but nonetheless, uh, you could get confidential treatment for this. But um, it, it's another way the SEC is attending to get information about how these offerings are conducted and that part has brought quite a bit of uh, commentary from folks. With that, uh, I want to mention just a few things that people are talking about and recommendations that we have. And then I want to turn it over for uh, some questions and discussion. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, uh, take a look at the comments we've been getting here in just a second. One of the things that should be fairly clear to you right away, if you're a securities counsel representing an issuer that wants to use a, a Rule 506, that is B or C, after September 23rd is, you're gonna to have to change your forms, okay? You're going to have to develop some verification procedures, uh, and in that context, you're gonna to have to help your clients develop um, investor inquiry questionnaires which go into, with regards to the individuals, um, the specifics of these four uh, sort of deemed safe harbors uh, for individuals with regards to net worth, income, uh, use of lawyers or whatever to validate or a prior investor. Now, one of the things you're going to have to remember here is the bad actor questionnaire because if you are selling uh, an offering that's big enough and you happen to be selling to a person who is going to get more than 20% of the company in the offering, that person will make the company be subject to the bad actor provisions. Okay. Now, 
that's a crossover to the fact you're going to have to come up with a bad actor questionnaire for the covered persons, which is much broader than the officer and director questionnaires that we've tended to use in the past with, when doing due diligence to assist our clients in disclosure with regards to Rule 506 offerings. Okay. Um, I should add that I haven't seen any norms or procedures coming out of other law firms yet. I haven't been doing a deep dive into all the um, conferences. I have been attending the SEC Federal Regula Regulation of Securities um, Exempt Offering Subcommittee meetings. I went to the summer one, uh, the uh, um, conference call in uh, last month in San Francisco. Uh, for those of you that do uh, receive Jesse Brill's uh, newsletter, the Corporate Council, um, which, which is a newsletter that's been going for about almost 40 years now, I noticed that in his May-June issue, uh, he says that he will be putting out a uh, bad actor questionnaire in a uh, sample questionnaire in his um, July-August issue. I haven't seen that one yet, but that'll certainly be a, a place to start. The Corporate Council newsletter um, of Jesse Brill. Um, I should mention that uh, I've read about 75 or 80 of the large law firm uh, releases uh, or discussions or memos on uh, these three, the two sets of enacted changes and the third set of proposed changes. And there's some pretty good memos out there, but nothing that's gotten yet to the place of norms that I could recommend to folks. Um, I should also note, though, that uh, these 506C verification procedures, I think, are likely to become the standard, uh, de facto standard, for the 506B uh, uh, verification as well. Uh, so we are what, basically raising the bar to sell to accredited investors under this old exemption, which, which is still around. 506B, which doesn't allow general advertising and general solicitation. Okay. Then for every deal uh, that we do as issuer's counsel, we're going to have to help the client create a list of covered persons and develop mechanisms to monitor for triggering events, not only prior to the um, offering beginning, but during the course of the offering. I mean, if someone, if a covered person becomes subject to a disqualifying event, we need to know about that. We need to have a reasonable procedure in place for finding out about that. And then we're going to need to have a plan in place uh, on how to remedy something if there's a triggering, if there's a triggering disqualifying event during our offering. Okay. A uh, common strategy being discussed is how to raise money uh, in this environment. And uh, one strategy is, well, we'll start our offering with an old-fashioned 506B offering without doing general advertising and general solicitation. We will do as much as we can there. And then as long as we've uh, kept taking the high road, covered the bad actor issues, and, and covered our, our verifications properly, uh, we'll do it at the tail end of the offering. We'll do a 506C general solicitation. Um, that works all right uh, uh, so far in my thinking. But one of the things we need to think about is the integration rules still apply. And for those of you who aren't familiar with those, the in integration rules are, are basically an SEC-created um, uh, set of rules that says you, in, uh, theoretically you can't take what, what, what would have been a public offering and chop it up a lot into a lot of private offerings. We're just going to integrate them all and call it a public offering that should have been registered. Uh, in this context, uh, it's going to be difficult to, to, uh, to, to, unless you start off saying we have a 506B that's also a 506C or we're thinking like that, one offering, it's going to be difficult to have simultaneous 506B and 506C separate offerings that won't get integrated. So when you turn the trigger on for general solicitation, um, it's going to be very important in looking forward on how you want to do things. And finally, I think we need to think about as well that the SEC wants to apply these bad actor rules to the other parts of Regulation D, which are 504, if you recall, and that's, 
discussed in the article on our website called Information for the Small Business Person Interested in Selling Securities. But in a nutshell, that goes up to a million dollars in a 12-month period that does not preempt the states. Okay. And then 505s, which nobody really uses, but are also subject to the bad actor provisions, which is another exempt offering. And also they want to apply these bad actor rules to Regulation A, which is uh, a, uh, a uh, qualified, uh, non-registered public offering that's been around for decades, but not often in use, although I used it some in the microbrewing industry back in the 90s here in Colorado. Um, it remains to be seen, and you should also think about this, there are other aspects of the JOBS Act which haven't yet been addressed by the SEC. Title III of the JOBS Act deals with crowdfunding, and we haven't even begun to talk about crowdfunding. Uh, Title IV deals with something called Reg A+, which would take the old Reg A and go up to uh, not $5 million, as you just heard, but go up to $50 million in a year, and that it looks like an opportunity but that might also have the bad actor rules involved as well. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, now to the uh, questions, if I can, I can see them here, and uh, see if I can respond. Just a second here. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, um, so let me uh, let me address some more issues, if I may. With regards to the reasonable care standard uh, for the purpose of determining whether you've got bad actors involved in your transaction, okay, I think it's pretty clear that you would be expected to have an in-depth knowledge of your own executive officers if you're an issuer and of the officers participating in securities offerings um, that you've gotten during the hiring process and in the course of developing an employment relationship with them. But with regards to these promoters and finders, you're going to have to go out there and do some digging uh, with questionnaires. You're going to have to get certifications and maybe contractual representations. Um, there are a lot of uh, folks uh, involved in the finder business uh, with regards to small businesses who are not uh, in the industry but who used to be in the broker-dealer community, and it is highly likely that those folks are um, not in that industry for a reason. Okay, um, it is the time frame for this inquiry. The question is, how far back do I go, and how deep do I have to go with my bad actor questionnaires? Uh, the SEC just says it has to be reasonable in relation to the circumstances of the offering and uh, their participants. Okay, we've got a question here. Um, to repeat the question, am I aware of any special issues related to offerings in the oil and gas industry? My answer is no. There is no special uh, singling out of the oil and gas industry. You have the traditional problems of do we or don't we have a security, but uh, I, no, there's been no commentary that I've seen that's peculiar to, the, to offerings in oil and gas. Are there other questions here? Okay, I'm going to go back to my uh, comments here. I don't want to uh, promote uh, any other particular law firms. Okay, here we go. Uh, certain online platforms have already posted on their websites the profile of companies trying to raise money. Isn't this a general solicitation? Shouldn't they have waited until after tw September 23rd? Well, I don't have enough specifics to answer that. The 
if I were advising an issuer that was putting their own offering on their own website, I would continue to give them the password protected advice that I have given them uh, for decades under LAMP Technologies and otherwise. Uh, LAMP Technologies is an SEC uh, uh, no action letter. Okay, uh, There are groups uh, that have platforms or mechanisms, and that uh, it raises a separate question, um, but like AngelList and some such, which even there, they should wait until after September 23rd before they match buyer and seller. Just uh, to, to explain, under the Title II of the Statute of Jobs Act, um, you are in, enable, you can use a platform or mechanism uh, to match buyer and seller under 506C if uh, w without being registered as a broker dealer, as long as you don't take transaction-based compensation and other, there are some other uh, restrictions on your platform or mechanism. I did a series of talks after the Jobs Act uh, came up, and I was asked to uh, go to the Colorado Bioscience uh, Association and go to the Colorado Software and Internet Association and talk to the associations about uh, associations setting up platforms or mechanisms, websites where they could match buyer and seller. I know that there are a number of uh, companies that operate platforms or mechanisms, um, and as uh, uh, certainly it will be easier to do that matching after the 23rd of September. I do not uh, believe you can use general solicitation, general advertising, and I have a client who wanted to do it today. And I, I, just before I got online here, I send him an email and I say, would you wait and can we talk about this before you do it? It's a high-tech startup and I'm depressed because it is going to be, as you've heard, it's very complicated and you have to do a lot of background work before you start generally advertising, uh, which includes a, an email blast out on the internet. I think that's an answer to that question. Uh, any other questions? Well, I think at this stage, um, I should um, stop this uh, talk. And uh, if Crystal's there, I want to bring her back in and have her uh, close it off for us. I thank you all for listening. I hope uh, that I've been uh, clear. Uh, I am showing you uh, our bios. Uh, Gil is much more pleasant than I am and much easier to get a hold of, but I'm very happy to take your emails and your phone calls and answer questions uh, that you have, lawyer to lawyer, no charge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. That was great. I just wanted to mention one last thing before we sign off. Uh, shortly after the presentation, I will circulate a follow-up email to each of you that includes John's contact information, a copy of his presentation, a recording of the webinar, as well as a brief survey. If anyone has any further questions, as John mentioned, you are welcome to contact him directly or his colleague, Gil. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you again for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.